So, welcome to my presentation. Um, let me first tell you what it is about. Since uh, some time I have been trying to create a new capital theory. So far there are two of them, that is the one of Mrs. and Hayek, and the other one of uh, Garrison. So what I'm trying to present is a third one, my personal one. Uh, there are three papers written uh, the second one I presented yesterday, actually, it was about the structure of production, and this paper will be about the accumulated saving, rate of interest, and rate of profit in a free market economy. Since the time is short, let's just go. First, accumulated savings. We will start from basic. So we have an agent, an economic agent, which saves some amount of money. He takes this money and lends it to somebody else so that the other one can invest them. After this money has been invested and the investment has returned, this money is paid back to the original person. So here we see three actually separate acts. The first is an act of strict saving. So the person restricts his consumption in order to get some money. Second, he gives this money to another person for investment. This is similar to this saving, but it's not exactly the same because the person who this saves uh, does not use his own money. Later, when the investment has returned, uh, <coughs> uh, the person investing it pays the money back to the original person. This again resembles saving, but it's not exactly the same because consumption is restricted in somebody else's interest. Actually, uh, there is no intention uh, to use this money in the future from the person doing it. You could say that we have three acts, as I said, strict saving, followed by, let's call it, white says this saving, and then saving again. So, but if you see, the money which, is, which has been saved stays in existence. It doesn't decrease or just disappear. So the original saver, after the money has been paid back to him, is at liberty even to consume the interest of this money. But he can, he can lend it again, and he need not save it another one. Uh, need not save again in order to invest. This is at a micro, a micro level, actually, but we can jump at a micro level because there are many acts like this in an economy. And if we add all these micro savings together, we could form what is called, what I call, an accumulated savings fund. So this is a fund of money which could be invested and reinvested. This fund exists and it doesn't need support or new money in order for investment to be possible. Um, so, this is what I meant actually in my previous articles when I explained how economic growth is possible, that is, investment could take place without net saving being uh, available. Uh, in every economy there are people who save, for instance, people save for retirement, they put, put money in the bank. But there are other people who this save, for instance, retirees drawing down their savings. And these two values could be the same. And then net saving will be zero. But still, these accumulated savings funds that I'm talking about will be there and will be available for investment. So how about depreciation? Depreciation is actually uh, a predictable cost, which could always be included in the economic calculation of the firm. In the same way as I spoke about this firm, there is another part of the economy which makes sure that depreciation is being compensated. So there is a, an amount of resources in every economy which has been separated exclusively just for that part. So what I established is that every economy has a fund of accumulated savings. What I didn't say is where they hide. So there are typically three places. Uh, note that my discussion is for a free market economy with a fixed monetary supply. And I need this simplification in order to work properly. So there are three places, three main places, so to say, where this accumulated savings hide. The first is the banking system. So banks uh, just lend money at such an interest rate, and uh, they choose their clients in such a way that they don't lose money, actually. So they're in the business of averaging over their clients. But the money that is there in the banking system, it stays. 
So it constantly flows back and forth to the economy. And this is the first place where these accumulated savings hides. The second place is the corporate bonds. So the interest on such bonds is so high as to compensate the risk of giving the loan. So this is the second place where we can find a, a big fund of accumulated savings used explicitly for investment, and a permanent one. The third and not so directly visible place is the money which is directly invested by the companies. So this does not differ much from what I discussed before. So in this case, a company lends, so to put it, uh, the money to itself. Then uh, once the investment has brought back fruits, it pays it back to itself. But note, what, the money is still available for investment after we have invested it. So we invest, the investment pays back, and we still have the money. So this is a particular example how a simple company need not save it. Just one saving once is enough. So let us jump to the rate of interest. Um, and how it is related to savings. What I stated is that there is a cumulative savings fund. And a part of this fund is directly invested. That is, a company invests its savings directly in the production. And what this investment uh, brings back is actually profit. But the other part, that is specifically the money from the banking system and from bonds, uh, they are being lent out to other, to other companies. And this is what brings back interest. So there is a difference between interest and profit, the way how it has been organized. Uh, so let us continue with um, the rate of interest. So in my view, they could be, how to say, in a better economy, they could be only local rates of interest. So I lend you some amount of some good, and you pay me back more of it. But uh, these rates of interest are separate. In order for them to interact, what we need is money, because the money is the common denominator, it's the common good which allows everything to be compared with each other. Um, fine. So, in a free market economy with a fixed monetary supply, we can see the natural rate of interest, actually, because it will be there, it won't be affected. So, let's say a bank lends money. Yes, there is a risk component to it, but if we average over the risk component, we'll get the value of zero. So we can observe it, or I believe, in such an idealized setup, we can observe it. Fine, but what are the determinants of the rate of interest? As I said, the rate of interest, the way I see it, is determined by the amount of accumulated savings that have been lent out. But this has consequences, and in particular about the prevalent uh, rate of interest, uh, the prevalent interest rate theory, which is accepted for in the Austrian economics, and that is the pure time preference theory. The pure time preference theory states that people, how to say, they, um, how much they save is determined by their current preferences. However, in reality, this is not so. Uh, what matters is how much has been saved, what this amount of accumulated saving is. And it is not determined by our previous preferences, but it is determined also by our previous ones. So in a way, this is a composite parameter. You could put it that way. The pure time preference theory is a time-independent theory. So how much we save in one period is practically a uh, does not depend on the previous one. In reality, the interest rate is a time-dependent parameter. That is, it depends how much we have saved in the previous uh, periods. Let us jump to the relation between the rate of interest and rate of profit. Again, we are talking about a free market economy. And now, with a fixed monetary supply, and I will discuss a simple bank. A simple bank has some equity capital and some capital lending capital, typically from outside. So C is the equity capital, CL is the lending capital. I is the income or interest which the bank receives. Then we can define the profit rate, which is the 
income or interests divided by the overall capital of the bank. This is by definition. We can just rearrange this formula by just multiplying by the overall capital, dividing by the lending capital, and then dividing, uh, this, yep, and then rearranging it again. By definition, the interest divided by the lending capital is the interest rate. So what we get from all these formulas at the end is this one. So what does it state? It states that the rate of interest is the rate of profit plus the so-called capital ratio plus one. The capital ratio is actually the uh, ratio of the, uh, of the own capital of the bank divided by the lending capital. And it's a relatively small number, less than one, but still it's bigger than zero. So what we get is that for this bank, the profit rate and the interest rate are not the same because the capital ratio is bigger than, uh, than zero. So basically the rate of interest must always be higher than the rate of profit. And this is a significant conclusion because it applies not only for the, to this bank, it applies to all banks in this free market economy. So what we found actually is that the rate of interest and rate of profit are not one and the same thing. And moreover, the rate of interest is high than that. Why is that? The reason is that we postulated implicitly that all capital in an economy must have equal returns. And this applies to the own capital of the bank. But this capital is necessary. It is the capital that allows lending. This is all the machines, people, buildings that just uh, allow for this money to be lent. So, and it is this capital that needs some rate of return, and that's what makes the interest rate higher than the profit rate. What is not clear from this formula is what depends on what. In other way, does the profit rate determine the interest rate or the other way around, or I don't know. So in my view, it is the profit rate that determines the interest rate. When one is looking for, uh, how to say, uh, relation between two variables, uh, the best way to search for the cause is to see what changes first and what changes second. In this sense, the profit rate is the basic one, because in order for uh, money to be saved, and that is to be lent, and to change the interest rate, it must be saved out of profit first. So to me personally, profit rate is the determinant of the interest rate. You can look at it from another point of view. Can we imagine an economy in which no money is lent? And could such an economy exist? Actually, yes, it could. This would mean that uh, all companies invest whatever they have saved in themselves. So some money will be invested and the economy will grow. Yes, it will be a slow, subpar growth, but growth nevertheless. Fine. So let us jump to the other significant problem. We, as I stated, in my view, the rate of profit determines the rate of interest. But then how is the rate of profit determined? So in a free market economy, which grows, I believe we'll have the, the growth in a stationary state. And this stationary state will be the following. There will be no net saving. So that means that all profits and all salaries in that economy will be consumed. So the consumption itself will be the sum of these two. And we'll have an amount of capital. Uh, so the rate of interest, uh, the rate of profit, sorry, will be determined by, by that part of the consumption that goes to profit divided by the overall uh, capital in the economy, measured at current market prices, also to put it by the structure of the economy. And th this structure has been chosen by the particular agents for whatever reason they are there. They could be saving, uh, they could have been a war which have wiped out some capital. Uh, there are many variables which affects it. But whatever it is, it is the structure that is there that determines what the rate of profit will be, from there what the rate of interest will be. So let me just conclude. What I state is that each an, eco each an economy has a fund of accumulated savings. And it is this part of the accumulated savings that has been lent that determines the rate of interest. And the rate of interest itself is determined by the rate of profit. However, they are not one and the same thing. The rate of interest is a little bit higher than the rate of profit. 
And the rate of profit itself is determined by the structure of the economy, however it could have been formed. Yeah. Thank you for your attention. If you have questions. Thank you very much for the sake of time. We have three minutes and 40 seconds for the questions and answers, so please, the floor is yours. First time. Uh, I believe they are under stress. <laughs> Probably, but we need to learn and live by the stress and with the stress. Second time, are there any questions? Okay, apparently there are, there are no questions okay, at the moment. You. But uh, what I would like to ask, because we have a few minutes of time, it's, it's my duty as, as, as a moderator in one hand, can you a bit more uh, explain and, uh, the connection between prevalent interest rate theory in free market economy? Sorry, what's more? The prevalent interest rate theory in free market economy. Briefly, you, uh, you, 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 you made that point during your speech, and if you can do it in the next minute, might be interesting for the, for the, for the, for the audience. So I'll just uh, repeat what I believe it is. So yes, from your point of view. Basically, course. I believe that the, this prevalent interest rate theory, which is the pure time, pre, pure time uh, interest theory, is wrong because it considers just what has been saved now. So it basically depends on the net interest or what people are willing to save in the moment, more or less. Uh, I don't view it this way. There is a fund of accumulated savings, which is formed not by the preferences now, but by the previous preferences. And since the time we have started accumulating, they may much, much could have happened in that time. Savings could have been lost due to wars or whatever. But it is this overall amount of savings that determines the rate of interest. So this does not fit well with the pure time preference theory. Thank you very much.